Look, there you are. You're on the screen. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? Hey, no, you gotta look at the camera. We're, we're YouTubing. I am excited about today's project because today I get to do a project that I've been wanting to do for probably about five or six years, which is a floating shelf. Basically, it's a shelf with no L brackets. Um, if you've ever made a shelf, you're probably familiar with these. I absolutely hate these things. They look awful. My brother contacted me recently and said that he tried to hang some shelves and this is all he had to work with. And I told him uh, that I hate using those and he said yes, they are absolutely horrible to work with. He doesn't like them, they look horrible. And so floating shelves are a way of getting rid of that main bracket that holds up shelves. So if you've ever used something like this for a shelf, you know how annoying that they can be. Yeeted. <laughs> I yeeted it. And so today we're gonna be working on some floating shelves. Now this is one of those projects that you can do with very limited tools. I'm mostly just gonna be using glue and clamps and screws, and that's gonna be doing the majority of the project. And so if you follow along with this project, it is something that you can do at home as well, even if you don't have a shop. Also, I have Ellie in the shop today because she keeps telling me that she had so much fun with the toy box that she wants to cut more boards. I think that was her favorite part of last last project. Daddy toy box. You wanna make a daddy toy box? Yeah. We are gonna be making shelves and Ellie is gonna help me cut the boards because that was her favorite part in the last video. Sound good? Yeah, Bob. And this is absolutely something that you can do at home as well <laughs> with limited tools. You are the most distracting <laughs> person I have ever worked with. No one is gonna be able to follow this intro. So basically all you really need for this project is glue and then I also bought these one by two furring strips two one by four pine boards, and then these one by eight boards. Okay, so uh, since I bought 10 foot boards, I'm gonna be cutting these at five minus two inches, so that puts us right about at 58. So we're gonna cut all of our shelf pieces at 58 inches. Okay, so do you remember how to do this? So we're gonna put this right here. We're gonna put our hand here to keep it safe, okay? Hey, you did it! Yay, Ellie! No, no. You wanna do more? Do you want to cut more, or are you all done? You all done? Okay, I will cut the rest of these. How about you go inside and finish watching your Frozen, okay? All right, let's go. All right, I will cut the rest of these. Okay, so what we're looking for is four of these main shelf pieces cut at 58 inches, and they need to be about eight inches wide. Six to eight inches would be fine for a shelf. And since you literally just watched a three-year-old cut this, uh, cut two of these boards, I'm gonna assume that you know that this is absolutely possible with limited tools. However, because I have it, I'm gonna use my miter saw to cut the rest of these boards. There we go, that's four. And now I need four uh, that are slightly longer from this side. So it's gonna be 58 plus two widths of this board here. Doing these limited tools projects are always really interesting because I don't have access to all of the same tools that I normally do with a project like this. What I would normally do is I would put glue in all the joints and then I would just use a nail gun and run that right along the side of it, but I don't have access to my nail gun with a limited tools project. And so instead, I'm gonna have to find workarounds uh, to solve that problem. And that's one of the interesting things that I don't think a lot of people realize about woodworking in general, is it's not about using all of the expensive tools. People always say the right tool for the right job. Uh, I completely disagree with that. Doing woodworking is all about figuring out how to work around the project with what you have. Uh, unless you're one of those people that can go out and buy the right tool every time you're doing a job. 
uh, which is why I'm a huge advocate for doing things by hand. And I will show you, I'm also a huge advocate <laughs> for painter's tape. Painter's tape is a very cheap way of solving these problems. If you don't have uh, the right clamps, if you don't have the right tools for the job and you're trying to glue things together, painter's tape solves about 99% of the problems that you're going to have. Okay, so the way this works is I have this piece is all one solid piece, and then this is going to go ahead and fit in here. We gotta find whichever side is the cleanest, and we're gonna put this on the bottom. Fits perfect. All right. All right. So that fits really well. So the idea is we're gonna put some screws in here to hold the bottom on. That way the bottom is removable. That's very important for making this whole system work because we haven't put any of the hardware in yet. I still have to figure out how to remove the bottom, but I got a couple ideas for that. We will do that next. This is a countersink bit. I know a lot of you think that you don't need to pre-drill and you don't need to countersink your screws, but I know for a fact, if you try to do this without pre-drilling and countersinking, you are going to split your wood, okay? Do not split your wood. There's so many beginners that try to just, you're like, ah, I don't need to pre-drill, I don't need to countersink, that's for chumps, and you're gonna split your wood, okay? Your wood has feelings, and I have feelings. Do not hurt my feelings. It will break out the end of your board and it's gonna look bad and I don't want that for you, okay? And so what I'm gonna be doing is I have made this countersink. Sorry, it's kind of squeaking. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna allow me to stop so that this countersink bit doesn't rip through. Look at that. There we go, beautiful. So now we come to the sanding step, and to tell you the truth, I feel like sanding is sort of a woodworker's secret. If anything doesn't match up properly, you can always just continue sanding until everything does match up on the outside surface. Everything can become in plane if you just keep sanding. And I know it gets kind of boring after a while, I probably sanded here for about an hour or so before everything was perfect, but sanding at a low grit until everything is in plane and then going over everything with the 100 grit and then the 200 grit, it just looks so nice when it's done. So this is the same staining process I've used in so many of my projects in the past. It starts with a pre-stain. Get that nice and coated over the entire surface. Then I put a generous amount of the gel stain over the top of all of the same surfaces. After I put the gel stain on all of the visible surfaces, I polish off all the excess stain in the same order I put them on, giving me a beautiful shine. I think there was something mixed in with this stain because it gave me a really interesting contrast that I wasn't expecting. With the shellac step, you have to be really careful to not cross any of your grains. You only want to go down the grain when putting the shellac on because even though your stain is supposedly dry, sometimes the residue will still move across the board. So if you go across the grain of the wood, you will notice some of the brush strokes. But if you go down the grain like you're supposed to, you actually won't see any of those flaws. 
One of the other things that I've learned to do is I put on a generous amount of the shellac on all of the sides of my piece. And then when I'm done applying it on all of these top layers, I go back uh, after five minutes and after 10 minutes to wipe off all of the drips on the bottom. No matter how thick or thin you put the shellac on, you're always gonna end up with drips underneath and you have to take care of those before it dries. Once it dries, there's really not much you can do about it. Uh, you can try sanding them off, but it never looks good. So make sure you wipe off all of the drips on the bottom before it dries. And the last step before these shelves are done is I need to drill a bunch of holes 16 inch on center coming out of the back of each of the shelves. What I'm also doing is I'm gonna be drilling a second set of holes eight inches off of that 16 inch on center so I can double the number of holes that are in the back and that gives us just a little bit of wiggle room uh, to push the shelves left or right once we find the studs. Hopefully all the studs in my brother's place are accurate and 16 inch on center the way they're supposed to be. I really love the way these things turned out. I always think it's funny whenever you bring a project into a darker environment that all of a sudden all the blemishes that you see in a brighter shop tend to just kind of disappear and I love that when you actually get the project into that darker location. I'm really hoping that this project serves as sort of a reminder that you really don't need all of the expensive tools to make something that you can enjoy. Even if you don't build these shelves, I'm really hoping that this project can serve as a bit of an inspiration to go out and just go start making something. Making things has been such an important part of my life over the last 15 years or so, and it has done amazing things for me psychologically. And that's a principle I really want to drive home on this channel, is the right tool for the right job, although, yes, it is important and you should try and get the right tools, but if you can't afford the right tools, you cannot let that keep you from going out and making things. It is incredibly important to just continue making things and to get better at your craft over time and to grow as a person and making helps you do that. It helps you learn patience, it helps you learn determination, it helps you uh, just become better with your hands and learn how to repair things and fix things and just make your life better. And on top of that, your art gives you an opportunity to say things you normally aren't able to say. If you end up making this project or any other project for that matter, go ahead and find me on Instagram. Post a picture of what you're making. I would love to see what some of my subscribers are making. I've already made contact with a few of you on Instagram and some of the things you guys make are just amazing. I love seeing that kind of stuff. I don't care if you do woodworking or metalworking or or, or knitting or crocheting. I don't care what it is you make, I want to see it. I've been uploading a lot of photography on there recently, but I also do the occasional updates so that you get to see what projects I'm working on before I upload. And a lot of the time I just use it as a very informal way of getting to know some of you subscribers. And every single one of you have something important to say. Whether you believe it or not, your art is going to say a lot about you and a lot about your craft, but it can really just say anything you want it to say. That's the great thing about art. It can mean whatever you want it to mean. And I know for a fact a lot of you have a lot of important stuff to say, so that's exactly what I want to see. 
Alright, that's enough ranting for one day. Um, thank you all for watching. Catch you all next time.